What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode eight of the Technological Podcast. This episode's all about the chief of staff role at tech companies. And the chief of staff role has been a new emerging role that uh, a lot of people have been gunning towards lately from uh, consulting or from business school. And this is pretty much the role that is the right hand man or, or woman to the CEO. So this person uh, gets down and dirty, gets uh, a bunch of things done, runs strategic initiatives, and pretty much gets to anything that the CEO can't get to. Uh, in this episode, we interview Omari Ross, who's currently a chief of staff at Adaptix, which is a Series A startup. And we get to learn about how he transitioned from uh, PwC to being a chief of staff what it's like being a chief of staff at a Series A startup and going from a huge big four uh, consulting firm to a very small uh, startup. We go into his day to day, um, also talk about how to prioritize your day. We talk a little bit about the line between being a CEO and being a chief of staff. Uh, we talk a little bit about how to get into the role and advice on breaking in. And we talk about what's next for Amari. So if you're interested in the chief of staff role at all, this uh, episode is the one for you. Hope you enjoy. Thanks. Welcome to the Technological Podcast. All right. Hello and welcome everybody to episode eight of Technological. Today, I'm excited to bring on special guest Omari Ross, who is joining us as a chief of staff currently at Adaptix. Omari has an interesting and awesome background where he joined Adaptix from uh, the consulting world over at PwC. And we're excited to kind of dive into his background, how he went through his consulting career, how he started to think about different roles and, and how he kind of landed into the, the place that he was today. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Omari. It'd be great if you could just give us a quick uh, intro on yourself. Cool. Hello, everyone. Omari Ross, currently the Chief of Staff at Adaptix. Um, born and raised in New York City, uh, kind of moving around a lot currently during these times and excited to be here on the podcast. Awesome. We're glad to have you, Omari. So, um, I think you know what would be helpful for for us and in, in the audience is if you could kind of walk us through you know prior prior to to where you are today um, and even you know even prior to, to PwC maybe let's start with like you know your undergrad um, what you studied kind of what what you um, what excited you to, to get into that that major and, and what your experience was like um, in college. Cool. Yeah, I guess I'll start with a little bit before undergrad and that kind of go into that story. So as I said, from New York City, uh, attended Babson College, was really fortunate to attend Babson on a full tuition scholarship via the Posse Foundation, which is a leadership scholarship out of New York and is actually located in um, many cities throughout the United States. Um, upon going to Babson, uh, why I went to Babson, honestly, is because I knew I wanted to do entrepreneurship. Um, in New York City, I always had kind of side hustles and small businesses. So entrepreneurship to me felt like the natural fit. So I went to a business school, right? Babson through and through his business. Um, in getting there, uh, initially I studied finance. So took a lot of finance courses and, and whatnot. But as I kind of progressed in my coursework at Babson, I also realized I had this uh, huge interest in technology. So I ended up double concentrating in both finance and technology, uh, taking a lot of courses on in both those disciplines. And with that, then upon graduation, I actually joined PwC in their advisory practice. So I guess that's kind of my path there. Yeah, that's awesome. Congrats on the full scholarship to Babson. Babson's great school, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial school too as well. So uh, awesome stuff. Uh, yeah, so transitioning into like how you found that first job, you know, what what kind of things were you thinking about? Um, did you know you wanted to get into consulting? You said you were you wanted to study entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, what what were you thinking about in terms of your first role? Yeah, so I think internships definitely helped. Right. As I was going through college, I had internships prior to college, during college. So I was just super used to interning and working. 
Uh, growing up in downtown Manhattan, I always had exposure to kind of Wall Street. I, I, I lived really close to Wall Street. And initially you saw finances like the end all be all, I guess also with like Wolf of Wall Street, right? That glamorous life that was portrayed there to some glamorous. Um, it was it was a world I really wanted to go into. And it was, I, I, while I had internships, I, I did some internships in banking. I did some on the business side of um, finance as well. I kind of realized that a lot of these processes, in my opinion, could be automated. And as and more and more, I saw a lot of technology be getting into these roles, such as banking, um, clearing, all these things, right? Technology was really at the epicenter of these roles. So then I started really considering technology more. Uh, during one of my, I actually took summer classes my freshman year, going into my sophomore year. And I, I took an IT class. Shout out to Professor Shankar. He's uh, um, actually a posse mentor as well. But it was when I took that class, I realized like, hey, tech is really cool as well. And, I, and it's still right using this kind of blanket statement of tech, but at least I knew I wanted to take more classes there. And, and that's kind of what had me realize that, hey, maybe I want to be more on the business side of tech, right? I didn't necessarily love coding while I, I, I do know some coding enough to be lethal and whatnot. Um, I really want to be on the business side of things. And that's kind of where consulting came into the mix, right? I remember when I was doing applications, you could kind of figure out management consulting, tech consulting are kind of the blend of both. So I ultimately decided consulting was the route I wanted to go and ended up at PwC. So kind of a follow up to you decided to go into consulting, but why did you not decide to recruit for tech? Did you feel like it was restricted and only for certain majors or uh, like what was your reason to do consulting over going into tech, even though you knew you loved tech? I really, I think a big part of it, having that finance background, um, I wasn't quite ready to make that maybe in my mind, that full leap over to like being a coder, being a solution engineer, kind of on the really technical side of things. I really do like living at the intersection of technology and business, right? Business is like a air quotes word, um, but all that, all that's in that realm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think, um, especially at, at, at Babs and where there is such a such a big focus on entrepreneurship, I'm sure a lot of your your peers went into. Um, you know, the, the finance side of things and in, in banking um, and consulting, and maybe that tech route was less um, sort of taken for, for um, you know, the, the culture you're, you're around. Uh, but that's great. So like, let's fast forward now to PwC. You're, you're now a management consultant. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, uh, maybe the practice you were in, some of the projects you were focused on and, and just generally day to day, you know, what, what you were doing. Yes. Yeah, so I was actually in their marketing sales and service transformations group. So really much more on the tech side of things. Um, while I found myself wearing more hats that had to do with the management project management side of things, scrum master, right. was a role that's pretty common. Um, I, I was really on these like large tech transformations, right? So um, anywhere from a large retailer looking to revamp some aspect of their um, tech presence to some really cool projects that I was actually really fortunate to get involved with where we were doing, uh, uh, we were redoing the tech for one of the largest, uh, for the largest LGBTQ suicide prevention hotline, right? So kind of more on a philanthropic note, but it really just shows you how tech is involved with almost all aspects of life today, right? So um, in these projects, as, as I mentioned, right, I'm, I'm typically wearing these kind of project management hats, staying more on the management side, knowing enough technology to be lethal, knowing how to speak that language, right? How to stay at the intersection of developers, relay those requirements, gather requirements from the business side of things, relay that over to um, various developers, as well as um, knowing how to temper and, and deal with executive management at different companies. So uh, you just do a lot, right? Consulting, you kind of have the ability, because I, I feel more and more like the tech and management side of things in consulting are coming close together, right? Consulting as a whole is moving, in my opinion, to this kind of implementation model. So regardless if you're on a strategy, management, technology, it all has to do with this kind of implementation model. Clearly there's 
parts of it that don't, but I, I, I personally saw a lot of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, that's pretty much, I think, answering your question um, as to what I, what I did there. Yeah, so we've been finding a lot of uh, traction from listeners to, or we're in consulting just like you and want to get into tech. So, you know, you're at PwC, you're, you're doing, uh, you know, transformation for sales, marketing, et cetera. Um, and now you're in tech. So looking back on it, what advice would you give to the people who are in that position that you were in? Like, what are some things that you should really pay attention to and like hone in on and learn um, to, to eventually get into tech? Yeah, I think the biggest thing about technology that people don't often think about is you got to stay relevant, right? We're always changing our phones. We're always getting the latest tech. You always hear about crazy new technologies coming out and about is really important to stay curious and stay reading and, and know about these technologies, right? Because a lot of times, believe it or not, just even being able to speak the language of, right, something that I deal with today, edge computing, that only, I, would, I don't even know what percentage of the world, but let's say 1% of the world can speak to, way less than that, but 0.1% of the world can speak to. The fact that you even know what that is and can understand how it works and what its applications are, you're potentially ahead of other people applying or, um, a big thing for me is in consulting, right? Again, we're, we keep putting this blanket word out, tech, 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 right? Tech has so many applications, so many things. So for me, something that really worked well was trying to delve into what does tech mean to me, right? What is the aspect of tech that I'm trying to get into? So I started just putting out feelers into my network of, um, hey, I really know I, I like this broad umbrella of technology, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what bucket I actually want to land into. So one, reading helped me make that decision, but then two, kind of speaking to people in my network to understand what that can really look like, what that manifest, what that manifestation can look like. And can you walk us quickly at a high level what it was like to make the transition from consulting to tech? So what your timeline was, how you targeted companies, how you thought about like skills that you had built at PwC and how you can apply them to different roles and maybe like the roles you were thinking about applying for. Because I remember when we talked and you were interested in uh, digital ventures, you were focused on like product as well as like venture architects. I'm like really curious, like how you targeted that search. Yeah, so I targeted that search again from my reading interest and whatnot. I also probably put out an absurd amount of feelers, but I think a lot of times people put out feelers with the thought process of, let me get an interview, let me get a job. But I put out these feelers to people just for like genuine, out of genuine curiosity and just to learn. And because I didn't necessarily like, hey, hey, I want to get a job. And then you go down the whole thing and then you get the job and they pull all these strings for you. You know that, you know, that's not really the job I want. So a big part of it for me in this kind of discovery process was just like learning what tech means for me and, and figuring that out. So how I went about that was um, a big LinkedIn person, right? I did not have LinkedIn Pro, but big on LinkedIn, uh, reaching out to various individuals. I started at a point having a, at least a template to a reach out and then kind of try to make it personal based on where they work or what they did. Uh, things that I was reading, you can often find the authors and they work at some sort of tech uh, institution or establishment or are well versed in that space. So I reach out to them, hey, I read your article. This part really resonated with me. How, will you, hey, can we talk about that further? And then in that conversation, my biggest thing in that conversation, it wasn't always like, hey, are you hiring my tagline? I was like, hey, do you have anything else that I can read to continue learning, to continue the conversation? And then with that, that if I, I found myself really interested in it, it turned into, okay, hey, is there any way that I can get a little taste of what you do? Can you give me a deliverable? And that and these are things that as a consultant, maybe if I wasn't super busy, I'm doing on a flight home, doing at night and at a minimum, I'm, I'm giving some air time to that on the weekends. So I, I think that answers at least parts of that kind of question. Yeah, I think that's super important just to show that you, you're not just reaching out to get the job, but you're genuinely interested in the industry and like what what the people are doing right instead of just saying like hey like i just want to interview i want to move so i think that's like a big takeaway for like anyone out there like looking for new jobs and i think it's it's super important i mean like because the biggest thing for me is unless you're like surefire know this firm place is where you want to go and they're smaller shops right you don't you don't want to sometimes 
burn a relationship because you like went, oh, I want the job, I want the job. And they start doing things for you on your behalf. But then you know that job isn't really for you. You get the offer and then you, excuse me, then you turn it down. Like that, that's not what I really want to do. It was really, I wanted to target what my interest first. Because the biggest thing about me leaving consulting is you get a lot of exposure in consulting, but I wanted to leave into something that I knew I was interested in, that I wanted, I would wake up every day being excited to do. And that's what that discovery process allowed me to find. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, um, as Avi was just mentioning, a common theme we we really find among you know everyone we've spoken to is is passion, right? Like everybody that um, gets to the role or the or the space that they're in today, they get there because they're not just doing you know the job on a day to day basis, but they're spending their you know personal time or time outside of work, um, either working on something you know tangible. Um, especially for some of the you know, software engineers, they're tinkering with, with some uh, their own personal projects on GitHub or um, from some, of, some of the more business side of people, they're reading about the industry or reading about various trends. Um, so that's great to hear. So then is it fair to say, you know, as you were going through this, this search, is it fair to say you were just kind of very open-minded and just kind of trying to do um, discovery as to, to seeing what domain you were, you were interested in, or, or were you looking at more from a perspective of what role you'd be interested in doing, or was it kind of a mix of both? I think it's a mix of both. Um, clearly wanted it to be forward looking, right? So considered, I think a promotion from the job that I was in or the, not the job, the role that I was in. Right. So that was a criteria, but then on top of that, I think going back to the discussion of entrepreneurship at Babson, I really knew I wanted to be hitting the pavement, getting things done in a smaller institution or a smaller company really appealed to me. So that was part of my decision-making criteria, a startup, right? Um, where I could get that exposure. Um, I guess location didn't play as big as a factor, but it was something I thought through. We wouldn't really be personally for me in a, in a thriving city. So in New York, uh, San Francisco, in Austin, something that, that has a big tech scene, even Miami now, right? Um, so I think through, I, I really thought through those things and use this kind of as guardrails. I, let me not say I would turn any opportunity on, right? It's almost like the greatest opportunity in the world is in, in blank country all the way across the world. I would have listened to that call and, and still take it in and, and given it my attention. But I had those guardrails in place to at least somewhat direct my search. Cause then you would, you kind of get lost in the sauce if you're just considering anything. Yeah. So transitioning into your current chief of staff role, uh, you know, you were saying earlier how, how you're a do it all kind of guy, you know, you, you had a bunch of side hustles growing up. How did you hear about this chief of staff role or chief of staff, the, the role in general? And how can you help our listeners understand, like, what is a chief of staff? Yes. Yeah, so how I heard about it, um, I think the first time I ever heard about it, you heard it in a political sense, um, Joe Biden's chief of staff, blank president's chief of staff. So um I already had under some understanding of like what that could look like. Um, and then in addition, just kind of reaching out to my network and people thinking about like, where's a good fit? Where's, where someone just needs to have a lot of energy and a lot of determination and organization. Chief of staff was a role that was mentioned to me a few times. So how I would kind of describe a chief of staff is maybe as a, you just got to execute, but kind of with that, you are a jack of all trades. So being a chief of staff, again, it's just execution, right? It's you're, you're going, you're seeing strategic initiatives from inception to completion. You're, um, you're dealing with uh, executives at the company, seeing things through. So like examples of my projects can be all the way from investor relations, right? We just raise a series A, um, dealing with those investors to quite literally, we just, um, stood up our new office because we grew so many people. So I was out in the Bay Area ordering furniture, getting ethernet cables dropped, uh, setting up cameras, all these things, right? So it goes from all the way from managerial work to quite literally operations work. And that's why I say jack of all trades. There's, there's really no, let me not say there's no task too small because there are some tasks that you may not, may not put on your plate, but you can, there's a wide spectrum of things that you do. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, 
I think some of our listeners possibly have heard of the, the chief of staff role. Um, but I think it's kind of this, this role that's growing it's, it's awareness, you know, in the industry, especially within tech companies. Um, so that's, it's great to hear your thoughts on it. Um, so I, I think another interesting thing that I'm sure people would love to hear about is how does that, that role kind of fit into the, the company that you work at and the size of the company and, and, you know, like, you know, how does it really apply there? So maybe we could talk a little bit about, you know, Adaptix, what you guys do from a, from a very high level. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe how your kind of, you know, strategic focus fits into the, the broader um, company's objectives. Yes, I guess Adaptix, just in kind of short, kind of a punchy version is we sell predictive analytics and control intelligence to industrial companies to enable operational efficiency and lower costs. So we have a software that quite literally sits on hardware and we're able to, um, in low latency, identify anomalies, trends, all this thing, gather a lot of data off this machinery and synthesize it to a point where it's very useful in near real time, real time, low latency for our clients. So that's what we do. Um, to add, to answer the second part of your question, um, how I fit into that, I think it's, we're striving for a culture of excellence, right? We need to do everything to the best of our ability. We are a very nimble company because we are smaller in nature. So you just have to have an individual in this role who's just kind of willing to do anything and everything that it takes to kind of get us to that next milestone benchmark. Uh, strategic position. So how I fit in every single day is different, but I guess the common thread is that I am always kind of a buffer between my CEO, right? So I'm the chief of staff to my CEO. Um, I really work on behalf of the entire company, but my job is to really specifically take things off his plate, ask as, act as a buffer, right? If I can take a call and decide what issues or things that need to be bubbled up to him. I, I, act, I act as that kind of permeable layer. So that's kind of how I fit into it, right? Enabling my CEO and the overall company, enabling the CEO to have more time than overall that enables the um, company to be more efficient. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it goes back to what you said in terms of having to be the jack of all trades and work across different functions. Uh, so I'm really curious if you could kind of give an example of a project you've worked on so far as like a chief of staff and just kind of give our listeners like an understanding of like a strategic initiative that they might be tasked with doing. So um, nothing sensitive though. If it's any sensitive data or anything like that. You know, yeah, I mean, a good example of one thing that I just did right from an operational standpoint was what I mentioned, uh, setting up the office and getting that all situated. Maybe on a, a more strategic front, uh, there's so many things that I kind of pull through, um, try to think through how we best leverage our investors and their ecosystem could be one, right? So our investors have a large portfolio of companies um, under their umbrella. Some of them may be good for a partnership. Some of them may have a resource that we could really leverage. Some of them may have a potential in at a client that we want to target, right? So thinking through that portfolio strategically to determine where can we get the, outside of the capital that these firms saw faith in us and saw confidence in us to give us that capital and, and clearly they're getting something in return for it, but um, how can we also leverage that network? And, and that's, that's a big one because you could maybe be hands off and, and not leverage those things, but those are the real reasons why we strategically talk, chose some of our investors, right? So that's an example of something that I, I, I have to think through and, and I'm constantly balancing that relationship. And just to quickly put this into perspective again, um, what's, what's the size of the company in terms of the number of employees and then where are you guys at in terms of funding? Uh, so we just closed our Series A um, okay. and we're, we're at 10 million there. And in terms of size, we've been we've been growing rapidly, and we're probably at, I would say about forty employees at the moment. But even just quite literally, uh, we were at, we were much less employees than that. It was just a few months ago. So we've, we're adding new people quite literally daily. 
How's that been being at such like an early stage company, right? Coming from PwC where you're working with like Fortune 100s or Fortune 500 companies and now you're at a 40 person company growing rapidly. I bet it's like a lot more ambiguity. So how have you kind of uh, worked within the company and how has the transition been overall? I wouldn't necessarily use the word ambiguous because I, I think we have really strong leadership. So they've been really clear in setting out um, milestones, benchmarks and, and where we need to go, especially my CEO that I work with, talk to constantly. Um, but I guess in terms of how it's been, it's just such a breadth of it, of experience, right? We have people coming from industry, other tech companies from all over. And then just that kind of direct access you have to such a stockpile of smart people is, is incredible. Like being able to work with people that may have been at a big, big um, consulting firm beforehand or working for people who are at a small startup working at people who are at a very niche uh, professional services company, all those things, it, you kind of see in like real time, how you're forming the culture, how you're forming the mission, how you're forming the vision. And that's super exciting. And, and it, it's really empowering at the same time. And you're learning a lot, always learning a lot. because Everyone has a different opinion on something or how it can be done or how they did it in the past. They're calling one experience or I did it this way at PwC, someone else did it this way at X company. And we're making like a, a smorgasbord, some mixed approach to that. So it's, it's really empowering and it's, it's exciting. So, you know, you're, you're at a series A startup. You're also the chief of staff. There's a million things to do. How do you even go about prioritizing your day? Like what to, what to focus on and prior, you know, not just your day, but I guess your week or your month. Like, how do you think about what to start with? Um, how do I think about what to start with? I think there's part of that's an internal barometer, I think, as to what's important, what's not. You have to be able to start filtering through what's not that important at the moment, what can what needs to be done immediately. Big thing is looking at timelines. A big, probably one of the biggest things is timelines, right? We have a board presentation three days out. Okay, like my next three days needs to be focused solely on this. We have a um, investor meeting four days out. Okay, we need to but the investor meeting requires um, this level of effort to get, right? Four hours of work to get set up. Okay, so I could maybe start looking at that a day or two before instead of a week before. So you gotta start, at first you don't necessarily know the level of effort required, maybe with task or something that's been kind of put on your plate. But as I've been getting through it and I'm, a, and I'm into this role, you start learning, okay, I can do this in X amount of time and it's this many days away. Start gauging how how much of a horizon you need to have in order to execute that to that level of excellence that's needed. Yeah, it kind of sounds like you're describing um, working backwards almost to some degree, like you have this sort of milestone of work you, you or, or a deadline or, or some sort of tangible date of, of some deliverable and then you kind of start to piecemeal approach all right what are the different milestones i i need to accomplish in order to get there and sometimes I, I sounds like it especially at a very fast moving i'm sure um startup you know things move quickly um so that's great like what would you say um you know in terms of your day-to-day -day, right of course you're your chief of staff to to the uh ceo like how would you say you go about um you know in addition to certain's question prioritizing your work, you know, um, but more importantly, like kind of putting it into the broad perspective of things. Like, do you kind of drive these things on your own? Um, is it more, you know, you take direction from, from, from the CEO or do you just kind of like, you know, figure it out yourself? I, I know um, different roles can be, you know, like you, you can take direction from somebody or people will give you kind of this big ballpark to play in and just say, you know, kind of go, go figure it out. Right. Um, yeah, how, how does that kind of work? Yeah, so again, I think it, it does matter the task. It also matters um, the sensitivity of the task, who's seeing it. Is it internal? Is it external? Um, is it going into a publication? Right, there's so many things you got to look at it from. That being said, um, right, so everyone's busy, but everyone will make time if it's, if it's crucial, if it's important, um, and if it needs, if it needs, it requires beyond just myself, right? So there, there could be an example of 
an investor thing that that's our facing where we maybe the whole team's going to lean in on that a little bit more but if i'm coming up with an internal process for how to do our sales gate process or an example i can i call upon people in the organization because i want their feedback i want their perspective i want to hear what they're they're doing but it's maybe a little less critical that i can i have a little bit of wiggle room in, in that deliverable we can real time during the meeting edit some things so maybe i'll just work on that on my own or I'll do something that, along that ballpark. So again, it, it, I think the thing that I'm trying to get at with, it, with this role is it's just so many different size and levels of tasks that at the end of the day, you, you, you just got to pull the resources that you need to get it done, but you also want to be efficient and self-sufficient when possible. Yeah, that makes sense. And when I'm thinking about this role, kind of how you described it, it almost seems as like you are you're the second CEO, right? The CEO doesn't have time to get to certain things. Like that's where the chief of staff comes in. So just kind of expanding upon that. How do you like, where, where is the line drawn between the CEO and the chief of staff? Like, is there, are there certain things that the CEO is really focusing on himself or herself? Uh, and, and maybe things that are better for you, like, where's that line drawn? I just want caveat because he might he still is very much the CEO. But with that, I, I kind of the buck, how I've been kind of drawing a line and a lot of things are operations versus strategy. While I may have my influence on the strategic side of things, hey, get this piece of research. Hey, can you help speak to this person and then God, provide me a synthesis of what they provided? Um, he is the ultimate determiner, the uh, uh, decision maker, sorry, um, with that strategy. On the operation side of things, right? Those are, while he always leans in, has his eye on all of those things and wants to understand what's going on, I may be the one to take a first pass in operationalizing a process or a standard or something along those lines. But I'm really leading in on those operations so that he can give us, so that he can provide more time to the company to give us that strategic vision, that strategic approach that's our real differentiator and, and can keep moving us forward. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I think that was a really good question, sorry. So thanks for like explaining that um, aspect of it. I kind of have like a simpler question, just kind of transitioning into this role. What, what have you found to be like really tough, right? Of course, like it's a great role and you know, you're learning so much, but for you, what have you struggled with the most in this transition and taking this new role? Um, I think it's, it's just a learning curve, right? Um, you're just, it's drastically different work at times than what you, there's things that are similar to consulting, but there's a lot of things that are just drastically different. You're working a lot of time, what, what, by the time a technology at times, or from my experience, got to consulting, it's very understood, it's predefined, it's containerized, and that's why professional services companies can consult on them, right? Because it's almost like a very easily repeatable process, or let me not say very easily, but it's a repeatable process. When you're working with a company on the cutting edge, right? No pun intended, I know we're an edge computing company, but part of us has the edge. But when you're working with a cutting edge company, a lot of what you do is undefined. The market sector is not defined. The, and we're defining that. We're defining our category. We're defining what's moving us forward. And we're defining what excellence looks like in this market segment. And we're even defining what, the, what customers look like. We're defining like so many aspects of things. So when you're pioneering Rightfully so, you have many past experiences that you can call upon and, and use as reference, but sometimes there isn't quite that reference point or there's a reference point that's in between two reference points that you need to figure out. And that that kind of unknown is super exciting. It's 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 what kind of makes you want to do this every day. And, and it, it's like what you're thinking about in the shower, right? Like, how am I going to, how are we going to position this? How are we going to do that? Um, so I think that's, Yes, challenging, but it's also the exciting part of the job as well. But it's that unknown aspect, right? You, you really have to do a lot of research, and hard work to, to think through these things. Yeah, that does sound super exciting. Just being there so early on, like being in the thick of it, growing something from like zero to, to something that could be huge is there, there's got to be something that's so exciting about that. So exactly. power to you. That's awesome. Uh, I was going to ask, um, so let's say that, you know, one of our listeners has decided, all right, you know, Omari's job is sweet. I want to become a chief of staff. What advice would you give him or her 
who, who wants to get a chief of staff role, like what advice would you give them to, to break in? I think that's, you have to be willing to do the work. Um, I think often as well, chief of staff is a lot of personal connections. So you're gonna have to build those connections, do that work, right? Like I, I have to think about it. I, I worked with my CEO offline probably for about 18 months until I got this job, right? I don't even know, some long period of time leaning in, asking questions, being curious and, and delivering deliverables to the best of my ability. Um, chief of staff, you're often working so intimately with someone that I think trying to build that connection as soon as possible or be as personable from the onset is really important. So I guess my advice to them would just be, I think I said it earlier, just like continue learning, continue from a genuine area, trying to have that conversation with with people in the space you want to have, right? A genuine concern, because I, I think that resonates a lot, right? When, when, when people can see you're coming from a genuine place, because you get a constant 100 million calls where someone's just like looking for a job, right? They're just looking for a job. And, and it's kind of like the question they ask are very genericized, they're not targeted, they're not focused. Um, and some people are really good at maybe putting off a facade, but I think with really good leaders who are looking for someone to be working so close with them, they, they can feel that energy. And it, it's important to, to have that stem from a genuine place. And another thing, it may sound very cool, but you have to really think through like, what would that look like if you did day-to-day? What, what are the sacrifices you're gonna uh, give off in maybe portions of your life for the period you have that role, right? It's not an easy role whatsoever. I know a lot of roles aren't easy, but you have to also be willing to accept that challenge. Yeah, great. I think that's that's uh, helpful advice, um, especially for I think a lot of people who are kind of spraying um, their uh, attempts to talk to people and, and going very wide and not approaching it from a very genuine sort of. Um, you know, I, I just want to learn about this space. I want to understand how I can add value um, to these people that I'm trying to network with or, or connect with. Um, so I think that's that's definitely good advice. Um, well, that that's great. And, and so, you know, I think kind of to, to wrap it up here, um, what what would you say is is next from here? Like, how, how would you want to continue to compound upon you know your experience now as as a consultant at PwC and working as, as chief of staff at a company that's, you know, raised its series A, um, you know, how do you, how do you kind of envision your, your career from here? I, I want, I want to envision us <laughs> ringing that IPO bell or something like that. Really. <laughs> um, I really do want Adaptics to grow. I, I, I really want us to be successful as possible. Um, take this company to some sort of exit. So I, I think, I mean, right so I have a million ideas of behind what my next step could be, but I am truthfully focused and do see this being a long lasting relationship and role, right? I've only been here uh, in a few months now and we're only at a series A, a B and a C, definitely are in, are coming in due time. So that's where I'm at with it because it's my horizons with this company, I think are, are long. So that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, I think we're we're praying for for an IPO for, for you too. I, I know it <laughs> some sort of exit, right? But at the end of the day, yeah. all that comes down to is we, we got to execute, we got to strive for this excellent, and you just got to get it done. So, really yeah. excited for what's to come for Adaptics. Yeah, you want to see you ringing that bell, closing bell, or I think it's closing <laughs> bell. Unless you do like a SPAC, you can always do a SPAC, and then we can hear about it in the news. So. Exactly. But yeah, is there um, anything in closing you would kind of? love to tell our viewers like anything you feel that we didn't touch on like any advice that you want to give really quickly um any advice that i would give quickly no i, I think pretty much everything said you um just the offer out there if, if anyone wants to talk to me talk to me reach out feel free to connect clearly very busy but i'll do my best to try to to uh, to answer that call <laughs>